you're a student and you uh, would like to go back with Miss Ivy and Mr. Nick and Miss Francis and Mr. Larry and uh, spend some time talking about the Lord Jesus and studying the Bible, you're welcome to go. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Welcome today. Uh, I greet you in the name of my Savior. I'm so glad you're here and worship with us. We have a lot of guests today, and I'm real thankful uh, that y'all chose to come and worship with us. I pray the Lord will make you feel at home and make you feel loved, and that he'll speak life into your, into your soul and your spirit. Randy, thank you, brother, for the reminder to remember. It's good for us to remember. It's easy for us to forget, isn't it? Um, before I forget it, um, Ashley and John Rimmers wanted me to just say a word of thanks. I was going to do it at the end, but I get wound up and I forget some of what I'm supposed to say at the end. So um, y'all know that Ashley's brother, Fontaine, passed away last weekend. I, well, a week ago this weekend. And um, anyway, the funeral was, was um, what was it, a week ago Thursday? Is that right, Friday? Thursday or Friday? And uh, so many of y'all came and represented our church family and so many of you I know have written and called and offered to help and prayed for her and for her family and uh, she just wanted you to know that she's grateful and um, I'm grateful too thank you for showing uh, that you get what it means to be a family um, I'm grateful to be a part of our spiritual family we're going to look at a big chapter today in the life of Christ those of you that are guests we're studying through the life of Christ and we are in the the last few months before Jesus finally travels to Jerusalem for the last time for the Passover and is arrested and dies on a cross. Uh, but we're not there yet. We're still in the late winter, very early spring, January, February time frame. And Jesus is actually on the east side of the Jordan River in an area called Perea. That's where Jacob's brother Esau, he and his family, he and his descendants settled that land 2,000 years earlier, give or take, a little a couple of, maybe 100 years. Uh, anyway, uh, Jesus and his disciples are over there in Perea. They're getting close. They're in the area. They're within a day's journey of Jerusalem. And Jesus knows that... Uh, the time is near, and you can, you can feel it in the words of John, the author, the writer, um, the apostle. Uh, there's a soberness, of, of, uh, it's solemn, it's serious. Jesus is getting much, the, the humor that John and the other gospel writers blend in, that's gone. There's nothing funny going on right now. This is a a serious time, and the, uh, the Lord Jesus is aware of it, and his disciples are aware of it, and John wants us to feel that. They know that they don't really know what's happening yet, but they know that something serious is, is happening. Jesus, is, his teaching is much more serious. He's not doing very many miracles. Now, he's going to do a stem winder today, uh, but uh, he's not doing a lot of miracles. He's actually not around the crowds. He's withdrawing to spend time with those closest to him that have made a more serious commitment to him. And uh, so that's sort of what's going on. Um, we're going to spend most of our time today in a little town called Bethany. And Bethany was just a suburb of, uh, I was going to say of Memphis, uh, of Jerusalem, sorry, a suburb of, of Jerusalem, about two miles due east of Jerusalem, uh, you had to leave. when you left Jerusalem, you would travel over the Mount of Olives, where Jesus spent a lot of time uh, discipling the twelve and in prayer. That would be sort of a place that he would have gone often. Miles, feet, and you would travel over the Mount of Olives, and then you would arrive two miles further east uh, in this little t village town called Bethany, and um, Jesus. That was where Jesus stayed. When you read about Jesus doing things in Jerusalem, he didn't stay in Jerusalem. Jerusalem would have been very expensive, very crowded. It was like going to New York. It was, it was, it was very, very busy. And so he would go out to Bethany uh, to spend the night when he was in Jerusalem. 
And he developed a deep friendship with a family there, a brother and two sisters, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And uh, they were not, they, they probably each had their own home, but they all lived in Bethany. And um, but what, one of the things that's unique about Bethany is that it was on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. So you would leave Jerusalem, go over the Mount of Olives, go through Bethany, and then you would tra- go down, 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 down to Jericho. And a lot of Jesus' miracles were done on this road. A lot of uh, the, the, his parables, the Good Samaritan, was on this road to Jericho and going to other places. And so popular route for the people that were leaving Jerusalem and going to other places. And so Bethany's a, um, a significant little village. Uh, we're going to find out that one of Jesus' dearest friends uh, gets sick. And the two, his two sisters send word to Jesus um, that he is sick. Jesus is over a day's journey in Perea, across the Jordan. And uh, they, they want Jesus to come and help. Uh, and we're going to discover that Jesus waits and doesn't come for four days. Uh, it took a day for the servants to get to Jesus. Then he waits two days and then he takes a day for him to get back. And so... Uh, we also discover, if you read this carefully, the, that the brother died the same day that the sisters sent word. So he got sick, the sisters sent word, and literally that, that afternoon he dies. And in that culture, for a lot of obvious reasons, the heat and the lack of... Uh, they were not able to make people... Uh, to to uh, embalm bodies then in that culture and so they buried you that day if you died one day you were buried that day and uh so he uh that afternoon they put him in the in in a a tomb if you will a little cave with a rock in front of it and uh uh he was there for at least parts of four days sort of give you the background there that just i thought it was interesting to to know that uh when you were buried in a cave in that day you uh, were placed there, and then a ro- uh, your body was prepared with spices and different things, and you were wrapped, and then you were placed in that cave, and then you stayed there for a year. And at the end of the year, the body, w- the family would come and take that body, and uh, basically it was just the the bones now, and they would place you in a little tiny box, little stone box. And then that stone box would be taken to a family cemetery plot, if you will. And the boxes were all placed there together so that a family would stay together uh, after they were buried. And let me see if there's anything else. that uh, uh, It says that a lot of people came from Jerusalem to, to mourn and grieve with Mary and Martha and comfort her. That's an indication that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were very wealthy, very prominent, very well-known in the Jerusalem area. And John wants us to see this. There's a lot of commotion going on. Uh, They mourned for seven days. And so for four days so far, there's been a lot of wailing. And if you've ever seen... People celebrate funerals in the Middle East, maybe on TV. I've had the privilege of seeing that in person. It, it, literally, rending of garments and throwing themselves on the ground and throwing dirt up in the air and wailing and moaning. That, that's, the com- that's the image that John wants us to see there. Um, let me see here. It's very significant that Jesus waits until four days. And that day... Uh, there was a belief, untrue, but held strongly that when somebody died, when a Jewish person died, the, his spirit stayed near the, the cave, the tomb, for three days. And there was the, the off chance, according to the, the folklore, come back in that person and he would come back to life. Okay, so on the fourth day, the family would always come to the tomb just to make sure that he was still dead. 
And so there's a, there's a lot going on here that John assumes we know. Uh, th- those of you that uh, uh, only the Lord could rejoice as much as I rejoice in the fact that some of you might have read this chapter. Um, uh, but if you read this chapter uh, ahead of time, did you notice anything unusual about the way Jesus handled this miracle? Very significant. This is the, the only time that Jesus does something. He totally flips it. Um, almost always, Jesus does a miracle and then he teaches on it. He does the miracle. He feeds uh, the 5,000, calms the storm, uh, heals a blind man or a lame man, and then he uses that miracle as an opportunity to teach. This is the only time where Jesus does it backwards. He teaches, he explains, and then he does the miracle. So it makes this, John wants us to notice that. He wants us to see that this is a very significant event for Jesus. He's trying to convey a lot to us. Um, Trying to see, oh, just FYI, only two times in the Gospels do you ever see Jesus crying, weeping. One, he weeps over Jerusalem, over their spiritual blindness and rejection of his ministry. And then he weeps here um, over the pain and the suffering associated with his friend and his sisters. Only time, only two times you see him weeping. Now, I'm not saying he didn't weep more. You just, we don't have a record of that. So, okay, let's read this real quickly. Lord help us. Okay. Uh, John 11. A man named Lazarus was ill. And he lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. This is, the Mar- this is the Mary who later poured the costly perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, your dear friend is very ill. When Jesus heard this, Laz, uh, he said, Lazarus won't, well, I'm sorry, Lazarus' illness won't end in death. No, this has occurred for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Huge statement. So though Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he stayed where he was on the east side of the Jordan River in Perea for two more days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But the disciples objected. Rabbi, teacher, only a few days ago, the people of Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going back there now? Jesus said, there's 12 hours of light every day. In the light, people can walk safely because they have the world's light. But at night, there's a danger of stumbling because there is no light. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to go and awaken him. And the disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll get better. Four or five times in this chapter, John emphasizes how Jesus says something with one meaning, and the people listening to him, they don't get it. Jesus says and means one thing, they hear and interpret it or receive it very differently. Huge message for us. Huge message for us. How often is Jesus speaking to us and what we're hearing and how we interpret it and apply it is not at all how he meant it. Um, so, when let's see. Uh, they thought Jesus meant Lazarus was sleeping, but Jesus meant that Lazarus was dead, well, had died. So he said plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will believe. Powerful statement. Lazarus has died. Tell him that to the sisters. Now he's talking to the disciples, but he's, you imagine the sisters, yeah, your loved one is that, and I'm glad that I wasn't there to help. It's a powerful statement. Let's go to him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go and die with Jesus. Was that sarcasm and spoken under Thomas's breath and John heard it? 
Or was that a declaration of, we're going to follow you? Wherever you go, we're, we're going to go. And if you die, we'll die with you. We, we don't know. Um, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told Lazarus had been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem, and many people came to console Mary and Martha in their loss. When Martha heard Jesus had come, she went to meet him. She did that because she, not because she loved Jesus more. Mary wasn't pouting. She wasn't on strike at the house mad at Jesus. You'll see that in a minute. Martha was the oldest sibling, hence it was her job to arrange things to greet people to make sure people were taken care of that decisions were made that fell on the oldest sibling and so that's why she did that versus Mary um, uh, let's see she Mar uh, Martha went out to meet him but Mary stayed at home Martha said Lord if only you had been here my brother wouldn't have died but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask Jesus said your brother will rise again Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. All who believe in me will live even after dying. All who live in me and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord. I've always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. John, it's a big deal to John that you and I, because he does it ex with, Mar with Martha and with Mary, it's a big deal to John that we see that Mary and Martha had a faith in Jesus that wasn't dependent on them getting their way. They didn't believe in Jesus so that when, as an insurance policy, so that when one of their loved ones got sick, hey, we've been nice to you. We've let you stay at our house. We've befriended you. We've helped you. We've fed you. You owe us. And when Jesus didn't come through, well, hey, we've paid in. We've paid in. You owed it. No, no, no. John wants us to see Mary and Martha. They're sad and they are confused and probably a little frustrated. But their faith in Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah, they do, they do not waver. It's not, if you do what I want, if you act the way I want you to, then I'll believe and I'll keep it. No, no, no. We believe. Win, lose, or draw. Man, we wish you'd have done this differently. We know the end of the story. They don't. In their minds, he's dead. And he's not coming back. At least not, you know. Uh, in, in, today, uh, uh, but their faith in Jesus is not based upon him acting like they want him to. It's a big deal to John. Then Martha went and told Mary that uh, the teacher is here and wants to see you. And so Mary immediately went to him. Jesus stayed outside Bethany at the place where Martha had met him. And when the people at the house saw Mary leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave. We, what John is implying is she and Martha are going to, this is the fourth day. You're supposed to go to the grave and make sure that nobody's popped up out of, you know, knocking on that rock going, hey, let me out of here. Uh, they're, you got, you're supposed to go and check on that. And so they're, they assume that's where, he's, that, that's where they're going. Um, when the, uh, let's see. So they followed her. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw Mary and the other people weeping, a deep anger welled up within him. Uh, it's a very unusual word. It's not anger like, I'm mad the people in Washington aren't, doing right or I'm mad that I got to pay taxes or I'm mad that I dropped that casserole on the floor it's not that kind of mad okay this is an anger it's a seething anger it is an indignation it's, a, it's as strong a word for anger as there is in the New Testament it's the it's the word 
that later John and the other apostles use for when the crowd screamed out, crucify him. Crucify him. That, that, that he is not out of control angry, but he is angry. Uh, and it's the word that was most often used for warriors that were preparing to go into battle. It's a huge idea there that Jesus, whatever that emotion is that uh, a, a, a warrior would, would, it would, how, you will not conquer my city. You will not take my family. You will not overcome my nation. Whatever that is, that's what Jesus was feeling. So it's a powerful idea. Um, he was, uh, let's see, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled and he asked, where, where have you put him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. The people nearby said, see how he loved him. But some said, couldn't he who healed a blind man have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry <laughs> as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone blocking its entrance. Jesus said, roll the stone away. But Martha, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, but Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days and the smell will be terrible. Jesus said, didn't I say uh, you would see God's glory if you received? But they rolled the, so they rolled the stone away. And then Jesus looked to heaven and said, Father, Thank you for hearing me. You've always heard me. But I said this out loud for the sake of all the people here. So they will believe you sent me. And then Jesus called, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet bound in cloth. And his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus said, unwrap him and let him go. My point today is not that Jesus... Uh, the point that Jesus uh, said, Lazarus, come out. But I'm telling you this, in my theology, if Jesus hadn't used his name first, every person in that graveyard would have jumped up out of that grave. Uh, gra they'd all come herding out of there. And he'd have to send them back. Shoo, shoo, shoo. Go right. No, I, did, I didn't mean all of y'all. I just meant my, my friend. But, so he, he was very important that he use his name. Only Lazarus, come out, is what he was saying. Because the rest of them <laughs> would have come too. Uh, I, I, do, I really do believe that. Um, okay, real quickly. I, I've said all along this journey that these stories, these accounts, when I use the word story, I don't mean fairy tales. These accounts of the events in the life of Jesus, while they introduce us to a lot of facts, a lot of interesting information, a lot of wonderful, lovely people, a lot of mean-spirited knucklehead, uh, ugly people too, okay? Um, you understand that the writers of the Gospels, including John, their purpose was not to enter... The point of this chapter is not to introduce us to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Are they important? Yes. Are they a vital part of the story? Yes. Are they wonderful people that Jesus loved? Yes. That's not John's concern. John wants you and John wants me to discover more about who Jesus is. So it begs the question, what does this chapter reveal to us about Jesus? And I want to just real quickly, I want to give you, I think, now, there's 30 things we could talk about. I want to give you six real quickly, and then I want to give you something to go home and think about. Number one, what does this chapter tell us or reveal to us about Jesus? What does John want us to learn or be reminded of, Randy? What does John want us to be reminded of about Jesus from reading this story? Number one, I think it's very obvious Jesus or John wants us to be reminded that Jesus loves people. Not like these politicians and movie stars who stand up and, oh, I love all of y'all. I love all. You don't even know my name. You don't love me. No, no, you don't love me. When Jesus 
love somebody, he loved them. He loved them. It was not in theory. It was not in uh, principle. It was not generally. He loved, no, no, no. You can't read this chapter and not walk away being convinced. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved them deeply, passionately, intimately. Just like a dad would love a child or a, 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 a mate would love their, their, their husband. Uh, uh, that Jesus loved these people. And Jesus grieved the suffering of the over the loss and the pain and the suffering of those that he loves. John wants us to know that. That when you hurt, Jesus hurts. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. And it's not dishonoring or disingenuous to add. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the lives of those that are left behind. That's what Jesus is. Jesus cares about Lazarus dying. He cares about his sisters left behind who are broken hearted. Jesus loves people and he loves me and he loves you. Second thing I think John wants us to take away is that now some of y'all I realize you come from different theological backgrounds than I do. Someday when we get to heaven, you'll probably be right and I'll probably be wrong. But until then, I get to be the pastor. And so we're going to talk about the way I see it, okay? Um, and later on, you can say, I told you, I told you. And I'll say, you're right, okay? But until then, all right? I can't read this chapter and not walk away being convinced. People that Jesus loves get sick. People that Jesus loves die. People that Jesus loves experience the loss of loved ones dying. There's no indication in this chapter, well, if Martha really had faith, if uh, Lazarus really had faith, this whole thing would have gone a different way. There's no indication of that. People that Jesus loves passionately loves. They go through terrible, unthinkable uh, situations of suffering and loss and confusion and darkness. John 11 declares that there are times when Jesus chooses not to prevent suffering and loss he doesn't rush in all the time. There are times when he does. Oh my gosh, I'm in a storm. Help me. And I'm sinking in the water. Help me, Jesus. And Jesus reaches out his arm and helps him. Yes. But there are times when Jesus chooses not to rescue us. And we need to, we need to, you can say I don't like that. <laughs> me either. I don't understand that. Me either. But John wants us to see that. That there are times when Jesus will not prevent or spare or rescue the people that he loves from suffering. But while he will not always rescue us, he's aware. He was aware of this situation and of this friend's uh, suffering and the suffering of these women uh, before the messenger ever got there. He's aware and he cares and he's involved and he's committed to using this for higher purposes than we can possibly imagine. He's going to take what was meant for evil, death. Death was committed to reaching down and ripping this family apart and putting a, 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 a cloud of fear and despondency and despair and, and, and gloom over everyone in this family and town. And Jesus allowed it to happen so that he could do something even more glorious in these people's lives than had the events never occurred. Jesus waits. Jesus waits to come. There are times when Jesus doesn't rush in and rescue people that he loves immediately. 
There are times that waiting and not helping is more an expression of love than rushing in and rescuing. Parents, there are times when waiting and not rescuing is a greater expression of love than rushing in and rescuing and delivering and preventing the pain and the other negative consequences. It's a difference in real help. Jesus always offers real help. Jesus has never been confronted with a genuine need and did not help. Never. The question is, how do you define real help? Sometimes the best help is no help. We step back and let things go for a while. It's very important that we see that John wants us to see that. The delay of help here by Jesus is not a lack of concern. It's not a a lack of awareness. It's not a lack of power. It's not a lack of not knowing what he should do. He just chooses to show his love at this in this situation at this moment by waiting. You can't read this without seeing a blind man could see. Bartimaeus could see it before he was healed. Um, that John wants us to see the perfect balance between Jesus' humanity and Jesus' deity. Is it startling that a man could raise the dead? Absolutely. Is it any more startling or any less startling that God would weep? A man that can raise the dead, a God that weeps over people's pain. John wants us to see that. That Jesus is 100% God. How do you know, Larry? He can raise the dead. Only God can do that. But he's also 100% man. How do you know, Larry? He weeps for people that are hurting. He understands loss and pain. He understands it and it breaks his heart. He's not 50% man and 50% God. It's very important that you and I get that. He's not half God and half man. He is, he's as much God as if he was not man at all. And he's as much man as if he was not God at all. He's 100% both. Jesus gets angry. I told you the word means agitated, enraged, furious, like a warrior preparing to defend his city, to attack his enemies. Why is he mad? Why is he so angry? Is he mad at Martha and Mary for crying over the loss of their brother? No. Who's, Who's he mad at? I think he's mad at death. I think he sees death for what it is. You're a robber. You have for. For 4,000 years, you have been robbing the people that I love. Since Adam and Eve died, since Abel died, you have been robbing people of everything that my father wanted to do for them. You have put them, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 says that men have lived in slavery to the fear of death. You have, and he's angry. I'm tired of you hurting the people that I love. I'm tired of it. And I'm about to show you, I'm about to give you a foretaste of what's to come. That's what John wants us to see there. He's mad at the impact and the cost of death upon his father's plans, his father's kingdom, those that his father has chosen to love. He's, I think there's probably some anger there because Jesus, as a man, he knows what he's about to have to do to deal with death. It's going to cost him dearly to bear the weight of, the, of your sin and my sin and every sin that was ever committed by anybody. And it makes Jesus mad that he's going to have to do that. To bear that filth and that hate and that blackness and that evil and that gore. And 
It makes him mad. That's why Jesus in the garden said, willingly do it. Yes. But no one would want, that's why Jesus in the garden said, Father, if there's any other way, there's any other way. And then lastly, John wants us to see the end of the story. This is Jesus' way of preparing his loved ones for what he's about to do in a few weeks. Jesus is Lord over death. Death does not have the final say. Jesus owns death. Jesus makes death his servant. And he makes death the servant of all that put their faith in him. I want to just say to you three things real quickly that I'd like you to go home and ponder. Number one, I think it's important that we recognize that Jesus orchestrated this very difficult, painful situation in the lives of people that he loves very much for a purpose. He has a purpose here. Jesus, you know, he's, Jesus always has a purpose. Jesus is never random. He's never capricious. He's never arbitrary. He doesn't just do things for the sake of doing. He has a purpose. And ultimately, if you ever ask yourself, what's God doing in my life? What's God doing in my daughter's life, Marvin? What's God doing in my daughter Sophie's life, George? What's God doing in my mate's life? What's God doing in my life? What's, my, what's God doing in the life of my, my co-worker that's meaner than a snake? Or my godly mother who's processing the grief of losing her husband? What's God doing in your life and in my life? It's always the same. Different methods. But what God's ultimately doing in every one of our lives is exactly what he was doing in the life of Lazarus and his daughter and his sisters. He wants to reveal his father's glory. He wanted Lazarus and he wanted those two women to see that his dad loved them. That his dad was bigger than death. That his dad was all powerful. That his dad was in control. That his dad had a solution for the biggest problem they would ever face. That God was orchestrating this for purposes that were beyond their understanding. But purposes that would ultimately fill them with joy and blessing. It's what is Jesus doing in your life and in my life? He wants us to see that the God of the Bible... His dad is beautiful. More beautiful than the most beautiful thing you've ever laid eyes on. That his dad is all wise. That he knows he doesn't fish for answers or try so different options. He knows what is best and right and good all the time. His power, his wisdom, his beauty, his grace, his goodness. Jesus is committed. He's passionately committed. To you and I knowing his father's love and having a relationship with his dad. There's nothing that Jesus could ever offer us that's more glorious or wonderful than to, rem than to tell us and to remind us. My dad is the greatest person that has ever existed. And he's worth getting to know. And he wants to know you. And he's a give him a try. Got plans for you that would knock your socks off. Give him a try. That's what Jesus was doing in the life of this family, this community, this city, this nation. And he's doing exactly the same thing in our lives as well. Sometimes Jesus reveals his Father's glory by doing things that you and I would put under the category of pleasant. He feeds, he heals, he comforts, he shines light, he gives encouragement, he gives hope. And we go, woo, yay! What a wonderful father. What a wonderful father. So full of comfort and mercy and grace. And that's Jesus' intent. At other times, he reveals his father's glory by removing the light. 
removing the health, removing the provision, removing the protection. Why? That's a whole other kettle of fish. But there are purposes and reasons, not the least of which Mary and Martha experienced the glory of God when their brother died and Jesus was not there to rescue him. But they also revealed the glory of God to everyone in that community because when they fell at the feet of Jesus and said, I believe in you even though you didn't save my brother, they were revealing that the treasure of of knowing Jesus was more important and wonderful than the treasure of getting your way. That's glorifying Jesus. That's pointing to people and saying, even when Jesus doesn't give me my way, He's so wonderful, I still am glad that I know Him. I still want to follow Him. I still want to trust Him. I think it's important that you and I I want you to stay with me on this one. I think it's important that you and I be challenged to consider what Thomas Carlyle once said. The tragedy of life is not what we suffer, but rather what we miss. The tragedy of life is not what we suffer, but what we miss. We see people suffering and our hearts go out to them. And it should, should, our hearts should go out. But folks, at the end of the day, you have to ask the question, do you think Mary and Martha and Lazarus would go, were they enjoying that journey? Were they pleased that God had chosen them for that journey? I doubt it. Who wants to die? Who wants to watch your loved one die? Who wants to stick a loved one in the ground? Who wants to do that? I don't think they enjoyed the journey at all. But if you could talk to them today, do you think they would say, I'm sorry I experienced it. I'm sorry I I, I wish that I had not been chosen. I wish that I had not been a part of watching my brother come up out of the grave, out of that tomb, and walk again. A few verses says, those stood there, and it says, I didn't finish, but the next few verses says, those that saw this, many of them placed their faith in Jesus. I think they would say, oh my gosh, I wouldn't swap it for anything. Did I like it? No. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. There's something that happens when we experience the work of God, even difficult, painful, confusing, off-putting activities of God. But when we see and experience the end result, we go, Thank you. I've been changed. We see in the next chapter, Jesus is literally, uh, we jump a couple of months from chapter 11 to chapter 12. But in chapter 12, we're in the last week of Jesus' life. And something happened in the life of Mary. And I believe it happened with this experience with her brother where she got it. This isn't just about my brother dying and rising again. Jesus had been telling his followers for years, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And they were like, what? What? Who shot John? What are you talking about? That didn't make any sense. Messiahs don't die. Gods don't die and rise. What what, what are you talking about? Mary got it. Because of this experience, this painful, dark, confusing hurtful experience something clicked in her mind as my brother died and rose again because of the power of Jesus 
Jesus is going to die and rise again by his own power. And we know that because a few weeks later, Jesus is preparing literally within a few days to die on the cross. And Mary enters the home where Jesus is. And she takes this perfume and she pours it on, on Jesus. And it says she was anointing him for his resurrection. Scholars say that that very expensive perfume that Mary pay, uh, poured on Jesus, that when that covered his body and his clothes, he probably, people didn't change their clothes very often. And that in a few days when Jesus was beaten, when he carried the cross and was beaten and taken out and he hung on that cross, that that perfume was activated by sweat and by moisture and that that perfume filled the nostrils of the Lord Jesus as he was standing before Pilate, as he was beaten, as he carried the cross, and as he hung on the cross. Do you think Mary, if you ask Mary, Mary, would you have missed that? I think Mary said, oh my goodness. To know that I could play a part, a role, in giving encouragement and comfort to the one that would die for me, I wouldn't swap it for the world. Was it hurtful? Was it painful? Was it pleasant? Yes and no. But I'm so thankful that God was at work doing things in my life that I could have never experienced and seen apart from the pain and the sorrow. You see that in the life of jo Joseph. Did you enjoy being sold as a slave? Did you enjoy being placed as a slave in Potiphar's house? Did you enjoy being framed by his wife? Did you enjoy getting thrown in prison? Did you enjoy getting forgotten by the uh, wine tasting dude? No. Would you have swapped it? Because clearly it prepared you for something really glorious. I wouldn't swap it for the world. David, would you have, did you enjoy being chased by uh, Saul and being accused and maligned and betrayed and wrongly treated? No, I didn't enjoy it a bit. But clearly, it prepared David to be the greatest king that Israel ever had. Would you swap it, David? No, I wouldn't swap it at all. It's very important that we see this. Last thing that I want to say, and I'm through. That little phrase, Jesus called out, let, or Jesus called, Lazarus, come out. I mean anything to you? Tell you what it means to me. When Jesus calls, it occurs. See, we call all the time. I call my grandson all the time. He'll be in the next room. Teddy, come here and see lad. Come here. <laughs> I could be calling that uh, garbage can right there. He'd listen. That garbage can more likely come than, than, than my grandson. No, he's not, he not listening to me. My calling doesn't create anything. But when Jesus calls, it occurs. When Jesus calls, what happened next is what he willed to occur. Lazarus came. Do you th think about a man being dead for four days and what Jesus had to overcome and transform so that that happened. Every organ, can you imagine what your eyes and lungs and heart and uh, uh, liver and everything else, what, what those uh, uh, organs would have looked like and been like after four days in a hot desert cave? 
Every cell in that man's body had to be totally changed so that he could stand up and walk out of there. And yet that was not an obstacle or a hindrance for Jesus in any way. Jesus' call overcame every obstacle for Lazarus to rise again. Folks, God's call is always unstoppable. God's call is always irresistible. God's call is always effective. God's call always overcomes every obstacle and all resistance. And he did. God called this man to come And he did. What's God called you to do? What has God called you to do? What is is the calling that God has placed upon your life? Do you know it? I think this room is filled with people who down deep, you know that God's called you to something. Oh, but Larry... It would take weeks to discuss all the obstacles to that happening. That could never happen. Let me just start. I can, you want to do it alphabetically? You want to do it chronologically? Let's talk about all the obstacles that, it would, that, that would never allow what I believe God's called me to do to occur. Any of those obstacles any tougher than raising a dead man after four days? When God has called us Maybe in your relationships. Maybe God's called you to forgive somebody that it is absolutely impossible. You, I, I, I know God's called me to do it. I can't do it. Maybe God's called you to some role, some relationship, some, some area of ministry, something where you know God has called me, but it's impossible. Well, if it's harder than raising a dead man, Okay, I'll give it to you. But I doubt it. I doubt it. Has God called me to some specific role, some job, some place, some opportunity, some challenge that terrifies me and that I know in my mind is impossible because of the problems and the obstacles? John wants us to to consider That when Jesus calls, what he calls will occur. I might not see it today. I might not feel it today. But when God calls, it will happen. Some of you, God's called you into a relationship with Him. And you've been putting it off. Because Larry, you don't understand my doubts. You don't understand my fears. You don't understand what a relationship, a serious, real, deep, rich relationship with Jesus, what that would mean, the repercussions and ramifications of of seriously saying, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you have power over death and I believe you died for me and I give you my life. Win, lose, or draw, hook, line, and sinker, I'm yours and I'll follow you till the day I die. Impossible. What about my doubts? What about my fears? God's call. Nothing can stop the call of God. Nothing can stop the call of God. Jesus worked it out for Lazarus. He'll work it out for you. Don't ignore. Don't reject. Don't put off what God is calling you to do. Give Him your life if that's your need today. 
double up your fist and say, by God, I'm going to follow you. I've known this is what Jesus wanted me to do for a long time. I'm going to follow you. Whatever that means, whatever that looks like. Tell somebody. Let them encourage you and help you and pray for you. Okay. Um, Kevin, you and Lisa come up here and help me. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. I'll read a verse to you out of Psalm 73. The psalmist says, I have no one in heaven but you. And I desire no one on earth but you. My health and my spirit may fail and weaken. But God remains the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We take bread each week, which represents the body of Jesus. And we take wine or juice. The juice is yellow and the wine's purple. We take wine and bread each week and we eat and we drink and we remember what the Son of God did for us 2,000 years ago when He died on the cross. The psalmist says, the psalmist sort of answers the question for me, who should take the Lord's Supper? Who, who, should take, who should come and eat and drink and give thanks and remember what Jesus did on the cross? The one that can honestly declare, warts and all, my heart and my health may fail, but you are my portion forever. If Jesus is your portion, he's your pick, he's your treasure, but I've, I, I do wrong and I mess up and I, get, I, I lay down and get off in the ditches and uh, oh my goodness, me too. But I can tell you without batting an eye, Jesus is my portion. At the end of the day, he's my portion. He's my portion. And I'm going to get to heaven because of him or I'm not going to get there. If that is your belief and your testimony, you, well, are you Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or Church Christ or uh, n- nothing? <laughs> All that's fine. But if Jesus is your portion, you come and you eat and you drink and you remember and you give thanks. There'll be people on my right and my left over by these windows. If you would like a prayer, go to them. They'll pray for you. They would love to pray for you and they'll pray in power and in wisdom, and in the Spirit, and they'll pray in confidence. You go and be prayed for if that is your need. You come.